Hello guys, and welcome to An Octave Higher. So, this is supposed to be episode 22, but... <laughs> funny story. The original episode 22, I played, but I didn't actually record. Which sounds terrible, which... You're right, it's bad! Um, I intended to record it, but I guess I just forgot that step. I don't know how. I could have swore I did it, but I guess I didn't. So, just to kind of recap, um, what in the world happened? Right, uh, so, Elise chose to hate Frederick. I remember that much. Um, I think Elise started li living with Aretha now, and yeah, the plans for Elise to be Fran's assistant were finalized properly at the university place. So yeah, that seems to be, that's what I remember happening. So just to catch you up very briefly, that's kind of what happened. So now I'm just gonna continue from <laughs> where I left off, which was where I chose to have Elise hate Frederick, and, um, yeah, this is gonna be terrible. Oh yeah, and I think Frederick invited, I think Frederick invited Elise to the competition, the sorcerer competition, I think he did that, or he's going to do that. Can't quite remember, but we'll find out, so, uh, let's go. All right, evening comes and it's time for my match. Right, yeah, okay, so he did invite them. Okay, okay, we got this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Sorcerer Stadium of the Kingdom of Overture. We have some exciting matches this evening, so sit tight and enjoy the show. I'm already standing at the center of the hexagon. My opponent is in front of me and the six crystal balls are floating above their six vertical vertices. All around us, thousands of spectators are watching. For our first match, we have the most promising sorcerer in the teenage group, Frederick Godwin. Some of you may remember how our young Lord Godwin even defeated Commander Wolf of the Dragoons last wind day. Taking a glance at the VIP seats, I see Elise, Franz, and Aretha sitting in the front row. I ensured that they received the best seats in the house. And his opponent, Gustav Nabo Na Nabokov? I think I messed that up the first playthrough, too. Ha! <laughs> And his opponent, Gustav Nabokov! My opponent is a young man around my age whose name I have never heard before. Probably a rookie player. Following a signal from the referee, the orchestra opens up in the match. Opens up the match with a moderately fast and elegant piece. It keeps on it keeps one on edge, but not so much as to send one into a panic. My objective, as with every match, is to destroy two of my opponent's three crystal balls while protecting my own crystal balls. If two of my three crystal balls get destroyed, it will be my loss. Gustav is already gathering his power, courage, so I have to begin preparing my attack as well. He will likely attack with fire, so should I counter with my own fire? No, that won't do. My gifted magical traits are willpower and compassion, but because I don't like using compassion magic, I always use courage. However, Elise is watching this match. She is gifted in courage, so I can't let her see how my weak fire is. There is no other choice. I'll have to win this with sheer willpower. Just as I start gathering willpower, Gustav suddenly twists his body and turns his back to me, firing a fireball at one of my crystals on his side of the arena. Rookie mistake number one. Shooting at a crystal behind your starting position as soon as the match begins is certainly an effective strategy to destroy one of your opponent's crystals. You are closer to that crystal than your opponent is, and since you're standing between it and him, it is very difficult for your opponent to protect that crystal. It's almost guaranteed that you will successfully break your opponent's crystal. However, no professional sorcerer player uses this strategy. Why? Because it's also a surefire way to make sure that you'll lose the match. In order to aim and attack the crystal behind you, you have to turn away from your opponent, exposing your back to him, leaving you completely vulnerable. Summon. A barrage of rocks take from above Gustav's exposed back and rain down mercilessly onto him. Ah! The rocky downpour topples him over, causing his body to clash against the glittering marble floor with almost as much force as the rocks storming his body. I gaze far beyond Gustav, who is now lying face down on the cold floor to see my crystal, which has been reduced to smoky ashes. Heh, <laughs> that's one point for him, but let's see how long he can keep fighting in the stance he in the state he's in now. For a while I just stand still, enjoying the orchestral piece. For me, battle music is half the fun of sorcerer. 
Gustav picks himself up with great effort, huffing and puffing, his face wincing in pain. If I hadn't been so lenient with my attack, I would have won by knockout. Heh, <laughs> let that be a lesson for you. D damn He powers up his magic again, this time it's intelligence. Fire and water, interesting combination. A violent stream of water streams out of his right hand, but I swiftly dodge it. But he is still not done. While the jet of water is still spurting out of his right hand like airborne river, he is already preparing another one with his left. But I'm not standing still either. I dodge the second water attack just as easily as the first. Another one comes, but I keep moving away from danger. Farther and farther away. Gustav stops attacking me when he finally realizes what I've been doing. I'm now only four or five long strides away from one of his crystals, to which I've slowly been getting myself closer and closer. I distracted him by dodging him. Seeing that he's about to have his crystal destroyed, Gustav roars and breaks into a hurried sprint, desperate to save his crystal. Rookie mistake number two. When you find yourself in a situation where your opponent is nearing one of your crystals while you're still considerably farther away from it, a rookie panics and runs after the opponent in an attempt to prevent him from destroying the crystal. However, the arena is wide, and unless you're able to run very fast indeed, it is unlikely that you'll be able to catch your opponent before he gets to your crystal. A better course of action is to run the other way to one of your opponent's crystals, putting you in the same tactical position as your opponent. Worst case scenario, you and your opponent both lose a crystal. Best case scenario, your opponent stops going after your crystal in order to stop you. In my current situation, if Gustav went after one of my crystals, I would have no choice but to try to stop him, because I'm already down one crystal, whereas all of his crystals are still intact. Yet he is now frantically running at me as though his pants were on fire. Summon. A solid wall of rock emerges from the floor under his crystal as I raise my hand upwards. The crystal shatters into a shower of sparkling glassy shards. Gustav stops running. He bends forward and places his hands on his knees. He's now not only in pain, but also out of stamina from sprinting. <sighs> I walk up to him, my pace in harmony with the orchestra, careful to maintain a safe distance from Gustav. Ah! With determined roar, with a determined roar, he is back to his fighting stance, stealing his battered body to face me again, despite the fatigue and the pain. A sudden burst of magical aura overflows from his body. His right hand is shaking, struggling to contain the energy of his intelligence. His left hand is heating up with courage. He is ready to unleash something big. Rookie mistake number three. When you find yourself in much poorer physical condition than your opponent, you resort to a desperate attack in the hopes of damaging your opponent enough to even out the odds. This almost never works out. Why? Because your poor physical condition weakens your magic, reducing your chances of winning the direct combat. Win bleh, 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 bleh. oh god. Reducing your chances of winning in direct combat. Your best met wow, I can't I can't do this today, Jesus. Your best bet in this situation is to maintain a safe distance between you, your opponent, and your remaining crystals. Crystals? Crystals? What am I? A fucking toddler? Crystals! Cr cr Jeez. While waiting for an opponent to attack his crystals. Yet Gustav seems to be betting everything on this one last attack. Ooh. Streams of water come out from his hand again, but this time the water freezes as soon as it is in the air. Gustav has unleashed an ice attack, a combo magic spell. Without thinking, I charge right in through an onslaught of ice shards. I let raw mana congregate in my hands and summon it, creating a spherical barrier that envelops my whole body as I continue charging. The ice shards hit the barrier and dissolve into icy water that coats the barrier and eats into it. Bad bug. Stupid aphids. There's plants upstairs and the bugs get down here sometimes. Within seconds, my barrier is blasted away to nothingness, but it has absorbed most of the ice magic. What remains of the attack is only enough to give me a chill and I don't stop running. In no time, I'm face to face with this rookie. Gustav is virtually stunned due to the stress the ice magic has inflicted on his fatigued body. He registers the danger he's in, but he is too battered, winded, and drained to even stand up straight. This is it, my friend. Summon. Again I summon a flock of rocks. They crash down into Gustav like a rain shower, knocking him down to the ground. Not wasting any time, I dash to another one of his crystals until I am close enough to conjure a massive boulder above the crystal. I let gravity handle the rest. I gaze back at Gustav, who's still out cold. Huh. I might have overdone it a little. SPECTACULAR! The match is over, ladies and gentlemen! Frederick Godwin has effortlessly shattered two of his opponent's crystals!
That was a really good match. Congratulations on your victory, Frederick. Yeah, that was a great match. Um, congratulations. I joined Elise and the others in the VIP seating area after the match. They are surely impressed with the ease with which I took care of my opponent. A splendid performance, if I say so myself. Elise even congratulated me. But it doesn't look like she has forgiven me yet. Well, my opponent was just a beginner, so it really wasn't all that impressive. Oh, he was a beginner? That must be why you only used willpower magic. You must have been going easy on him. I yeah, you might say I was giving him a handicap. The next match begins soon after the staff has finished replacing the crystals and reconstructing the arena. It's either match... It's another match between amateurs, although this time from a higher age bracket. We all watch the match attentively, every so often commenting about interesting magic spells or particularly clever strategies that the sorcerers employ. Hey, I'm thirsty. I'm gonna go get some drinks. Oh, I'll go with you. Um, I'm thirsty too. We'll bring back enough for everyone, so you just stay here. But, but... Oh no, poor little Elise, all left alone with the guy she hates. <laughs> Before Elise can say anything, Franz and Aretha have already disappeared, leaving us alone. Uh, This is my chance to apologize to Elise. Um, Elise? Y yeah She still won't look me in the eye. I'm sorry. Huh? At last she meets my gaze, wide-eyed and flustered. I'd like to apologize about what I said to you two days ago. Oh, she's so flustered. She's so cute. She's fidgeting in her seat and looking down at her feet. I suppose she won't make this easy for me. I I saw you going to Mason de Beauvoir, so I just thought that you were... Uh, at any rate, it was entirely my mistake. Just because you were there doesn't mean you worked there. I'm very sorry about my behavior the other day. Elise hesitates for a moment, but finally she looks me straight in the eyes. Okay. Okay? You... you'll forgive me? Yeah, I do. Even though she hates you! <laughs> Cause I made it so that she hates you. Oh, the... thank you, Elise. Okay. Elise might have forgiven me, but she doesn't seem that comfortable being alone with me just yet. I should say something to her. What do you think about my magic? What do you think about Sorcerer? What do you think about the orchestra? Well, I already asked her about the orchestra once already in the last playthrough, so I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> and this sounds way too egotistical, so I'll probably just ask her what she thinks about Sorcerer. What do you think about Sorcerer? Huh? Uh, I think it's interesting. I've never seen magic used in a competition before. It makes me happy to see Elise enjoying herself. It's good to know that you enjoyed the match. And that music. The music was wonderful. I didn't know our orchestras were used at sporting events. This is like being in a concert, but more exciting. Yes, symphony in C minor, Odora de Spirito Adolescente. A hauntingly beautiful piece indeed. Is that the title? Wow, I really, really loved that piece. I wish I could play it on the piano. Huh? But it's an orchestral piece. I know, but if I had the score, I think I could rearrange it into a piano piece. <laughs> is that so? You must be a great musician. No, I'm not that great, and I don't know if I could be called a musician yet, although I hope to become one someday. You definitely have the talent for that. When you played the piano at my house, I thought you were really amazing. The memory of listening to Elisa's piano resurfaces in my mind, reminding me of the pleasant sound of her music. Unfortunately, it also reminds me of how I had lost control of myself and upset her so badly. Thanks! <laughs> I can't wait to play the piano again. Well, you can. I was going to say that she could come to my house to play the piano any time, but it's probably not very wise to bring such things up just yet. Hmm? If you could fix the broken piano, you would be able to play to your heart's content. Yeah, exactly! I hope I'll be able to fix it soon! The mere mention of that piano is able to lift Elisa's spirit. Hello, guys! We have come bearing gifts! Just drinks, I'm afraid. Here, Elise, Frederick. Thanks. Thank you. Hours later, after all the matches have ended, we head home together. That's when I learned that Elise is staying together with Aretha, which means she doesn't work at Mason de Beauvoir after all. I'm relieved, to be honest. And is he gonna end up creating the score again? Am I, like, just making it so that everything just kind of... Well, I don't know. I feel like I last game I made it so that there would have been a point here if she would have forgiven 
Frederick and said that she didn't hate him. And I would have I would have had two points here if I would have said Aretha's name three times and gone on the date with her. But I only did... I didn't say her name three times, but I went on the date with her. And last time, I said her name three times but didn't go on the date with her. So this is still kind of the same. And this, I had it at zero before, probably. Because I said that he was my employer or whatever, rather than my friend. So... I feel like I'm doing things slightly differently, but also not really. I don't know. I, I don't know. Like, it, it's, it's so hard to figure it out when the point system wasn't introduced before. Like, it just kind of introduced itself somewhere that was kind of like right a little bit after I started doing this second Let's Play. So then it's like, I don't even... Ah... Uh... I don't know. I'll figure it out. Somehow, I need to change something so that I get a different ending. But it has to be a satisfying one. Because if I get another unsatisfying one, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. Like, I would play it again, but I don't want to do it right away. Like, I kind of want to give myself some time away from it before I go back kind of deal. Because that's what I find works better for me if I do it like that. Because... Yeah, I don't... I get bored. Well, not really bored, but I get kind of irritated if I have to, like, constantly try and do a different ending one after the other, if that makes sense. So, yeah. I'll probably take a break after this if I don't get the ending I want and just play a couple of other games and then come back, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Anyway. Even after we part ways, I can't stop thinking about Elise. I'm glad I was able to make amends with her. It's also nice that she seemed to have genuinely enjoyed watching the sorcerer matches. However, I could still feel that she was somehow distant. The way she talked to friends and Aretha is different from the way she talked to me. The way she smiled to them is not the same as the way she smiled to me. There's a certain closeness between them that just doesn't exist between us. That's unavoidable considering how I botched her first impression of me, but still, I feel jealous. I want to be close to her. I want to be an important someone for her. I want her to need me. I want to be able to make her smile. I want to make her happy. I sit back in a chair, tilting my head backwards, I gaze through the ceiling, the roof, the sky and the stars and whatever lies beyond, right into a void as empty and as dark as my heart. So empty, yet so full. So dark, yet so bright. For Elise is there. She is now forever in my mind. When my consciousness returns to the room, my eyes alight on the piano. The piano! Right at this instant, it seems to shine brighter even than the magical light that illuminates the room. The piano with which Elise performed a sonata so mesmerizing that it blinded my spirit and silenced my mind. The piano from which her music came to life. The music that symbolizes her various dream. That's right. Music is the only thing beyond all others that can give Elise happiness. To one day be a musician is her dream. I wish I could do something to help her achieve that dream. I wish to do something for her. For Elise. She said she loved the piece that accompanied my match, Symphony in C minor, Odoras de Spiretto Adolescente. She wanted to rearrange it for the piano so that she could play it herself. Odora de Spiretto Adolescente is a fairly well-known piece. I'm sure Father has a score somewhere in the music room. I get up and go into the music room to look for the score. My father is a fan of string instruments, so in the music room you can find some violins, some violas, a cello, and a contrabass. I haven't been in here since I was a child. Without any idea where I'm supposed to be looking, I start with a bookcase next to the contrabass. On the shelves there are well over a thousand sheets of music. I imagine how exhausting this is going to be. Frankly, I would give up if I didn't remember that I was doing this for Elise. After going through 20 or 30 sheets, I realize that they are sorted by composer, so I try to find where music from the composer of Odora de Spirito Adolescente is located in the bookcase. I look and look, but I'm unable to find it. I've gone through the whole bookcase, but I still can't find any scores from the right composer, so I move on to the next bookcase. It houses a similar number of sheets. I look and look again, but the scores of the composer's music are still nowhere to be found. As I walk to the next bookcase, I glance at my chronometer. It's almost midnight. Normally, I'd have gone to sleep, but now I want to do this for Elise. At last, I find a score of the symphony written by the same composer as Adora de Spirito Adolescente, so the score I'm looking for should be somewhere in here. Unfortunately for me, this composer is quite prolific, and his music occupies a whole shelf in the bookcase. With a sigh, I start from the left, reading the pieces off one by one. I can't give up now, because I want to do something, anything for Elise. At last I reach the end of the shelf, but I've still not come across the correct piece. It should be here together with the scores of other musical pieces from the same composer, but it's not. 
Does my father not have the score for this piece? That's not possible, but where is it then? I scan the room. Let's see. My father and the butlers are too meticulous to have sorted these scores badly. Ah! My father's work desk. On the desk are a few sheets of paper, but none of them are the score. Then, noticing a drawer on the desk, I open it. And there's the score, inside the drawer. It's been hiding here all along. Reading Symphony in C minor, Odora Desperato Adolescente on a piece of paper has never been this gratifying. But now a problem. What am I going to do with the score? There's only one copy of it here. Since the score is in the drawer of my father's desk, I expect, I expect he's doing something with it. That means I can't just give it to Elise. I have no other choice but to copy the score by hand. I take it to my room. I have to quickly make a copy of it because I have to put the score back inside the drawer before my father starts work tomorrow morning. And there he goes, copying the score all over again. The chronometer shows that it is a little after midnight. The sleepiness overcomes me as it always does on a night after a sorcerer match. With a pen in one hand, the score and empty sheets of paper on my desk, and my listless body warily perched on a chair, I set out to copy the score. All 24 pages full of obscure musical symbols. Let's see, that note goes here, that one here, and... Is that on the third or the fourth line? Oh, the fourth. Wait, this note isn't colored in. This one has a flag on its stem. I feel drowsy. Maybe I should get one of the servants to do this for me. But no, I can't do that. They might make a mistake. This is my responsibility. Half an hour later, I'm done with the first page. That was too slow. With that kind of pace, I won't be able to finish before morning. I have to try doing this faster. I grab a new sheet of paper and proceed to the next page, forcing myself to stay awake and struggling to keep my hand from shaking. Halfway done. I thought of checking the chronometer, but decided there was no point. I'll just keep going. I'm tired, but I've decided to do this for Elise, because I want to see her smile. If she will only smile, it will have been do worth doing this. It will have been worth a sleepless night. When the notes on the score start to get blurry, I slap myself to stay awake. As time wears on, I have to slap myself more and more often. Finally, it's done. I check the whole thing again to make sure that I haven't made any mistakes, and then I carefully set the copy aside on my desk and quickly return the original score to its drawer in the music room. Back in my room, I collapse onto my bed, drowned... Oh, I see. Drowned in exhaustion, but satisfied that I was able to make this gift of music that Elise wanted. With this, I can help Elise achieve her dream. At the very least, she will be happy because she can play the music she loves on the piano. I wonder what kind of smile she may she'll make when I give this to her. The thought puts a smile on my own face. I'm happy to have done something for her. For Elise. I slip into a deep sleep as the first light of morning slips into my room. Water day, 36 Tellus, AM, 313. I am woken up by the sound of knocking on my door, followed by the voice of a maid from behind the door. My lord, lunch has been served. With a groan, I force myself to get up and drag myself downstairs. Father has gone out somewhere, so I sit by myself at the dining table. Some dishes are already prepared. Suddenly aware that I had missed breakfast this morning, I devour a thin slice of marinated raw salmon, barely tasting it. Despite having slept through the morning, my eyelids still feel heavy as lead. Well, at least I managed to copy that score for Elise. I take a bite of veal loin roast. <clears throat> Excuse me. But before I can judge its taste, I remember that I have to give the copy of the score to Elise before she leaves the conservatoire for home. Hastily, I finish my meal, shower, and leave the house. Why, if it isn't young Lord Godwin, what brings you to my humble laboratory? I've come to the laboratory after arriving at the conservatoire in a taxi carriage, but for some reason Elise isn't here. Neither is Franz. Instead, I see the professor who had visited my father last week. Yesterday I used Sorcerer as an excuse to look for friends and Elise, but in my haste I hadn't thought of any reason why I might come here today. I, um, I'm looking for friends. Ho oh, ho ho ho, I didn't know the two of you have become so close. It's too bad the friends left this morning. Where did he go? The factory. He hadn't been seeing any progress with his assistant's magic, so he thought he should try for reproducing the effect in the original setting. He took Elise back to the slums? I see, the factory. Thank you very much, Professor. You're welcome, young lord. And here we are! At first, the taxi carriage driver refused to take me all the way to the factory, but he's finally convinced when I offer to double the fare. Now, where is Elise? Franz had mentioned that he had seen Elise try to fix the piano in some yard behind the factory, so they must be in the same yard right now. Now, where might that be? 
I scan my surroundings, but there isn't any place that resembles a yard. Instead, I see a worker near the factory entrance. I call out to her. Hey, you! Uh, are you talking to me? Yes, I'm looking for a yard. Uh, a, a yard? Which one? I don't know. I was told there was a backyard to this factory, one with a piano in it. Oh, the piano. Yeah, sure, just follow that path and you'll find it. Her direction leads me to a narrow grassy path sandwiched between the concrete fence surrounding the factory complex and the outer wall of the factory building. After walking several hundred feet, an open area is visible at the end of the path. As I draw closer to the opening, I can feel a concentration of compassion magic emanating from it. The compassion magic paints my vision with vast whiteness, and then I hear it. A piano sound. As soon as my vision returns a half second later, I rush to where the sound comes from. Frederick? Huh? Frederick, what are you doing here? Elise is facing the piano, her downturned hands suspended a few inches above the keyboard. Franz is standing next to her. They blink at my unannounced presence. The piano? Was it fixed? <laughs> Not at all. Elise presses some keys, but no sounds come out. But your magic certainly feels different here than in the lab. If we could get enough data for analysis, we might be able to figure out a way to make it work. Then let's continue, Franz. Sure. The piano is still broken, so why did I hear a piano sound? Wait, did I really hear it? No, there couldn't have been a sound. It was just my imagination. I thought I had heard something, but now I know I didn't really hear anything. What a very strange feeling. But I'm not here to think about the piano. Um, Elise? Yes? Here. I hand the copy of the score to Elise. Huh? What is this? It's the score of Odora de Spirito Adolescente. Oh, yesterday's sorcerer music, right? She flips through the pages with a blank look on her face. Yeah, didn't you say that you wanted to play it on the piano? Yeah, I think playing this piece on the piano would be fun. Um, is... is this for me? Yes, of course. I made it for you. Well, uh, thank you, Frederick. She clutches the score to her chest with a weak smile, the same kind of smile one gives to strangers at one's father's birthday party. Elise, shall we continue? Yeah, let's continue. Facing the piano again, with both palms open in front of the piano, Elise lets her mana flow through her straightened arms to her hands. Franz tries pressing some keys. Hearing no sounds, he shakes his head slowly. Still broken, as expected. Ugh. Let's try it again. Okay. Wait, wait, what about the score I gave her? Isn't she going to say anything about that? Oh, right. This is the part where he fucks shit up and then he runs off and then gets kidnapped. I'm basically just doing the exact same thing all over again. No. I thought this would change something. She turns to me with the same expression, emotionless expression. Yeah? Ignoring friends who's staring irately at me from the corner of his eyes, I say to Elise, After you've rearranged the piece for piano, you can play it at my house anytime you want. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> oh, fuck. Actually, Elise would rather play it on this piano, so she has to work on fixing it now. What's with this guy? I'm talking to Elise, damn it. He's getting on my nerves. Oh, jeez. No. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, God. Fuck. Okay. Heh, I don't see you making any progress with your research. When will she be able to play that piano, I wonder? Franz is visibly annoyed. We would find it- We would find an, an answer to that question much faster if we could work on it without any distraction. Distraction? I was just trying to do something for Elise. I wasn't trying to get in the way of her work. But it's true that she isn't too happy with me being here. I thought she'd be overjoyed after receiving the score, but she isn't. I feel foolish. Why did I come here? My fists are shaking. No! Oh, this is painful to see a second time. This is just as painful as the first time. Oh my god. Ha! I just came to give her a way out of her stupid experiment so she won't have to deal with that. That piece of trash piano that anyone with with half a brain knows will never make a sound again. Oh no. For a moment, there's only silence. I can see surprise on both friends and Elisa's faces. Elise scowls and looks away. What am I doing? I'm upsetting Elise. Elise, who I worked so hard to please. Then Franz explodes in anger. What? Didn't you convince Lord Godwin to fund my research because you wanted to support it? 
Right. I'm supposed to act as if I wanted to support his research, but he's at really making my blood boil. I can't even talk to Elise without him interrupting everything. I apologized last time. Oh, and I want to apologize this time, too. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm saving. I need to save for my own sanity. Oh, God. Because, like, it's at one. So I feel like if I apologized, it would make it two. But I don't want to do the same things as last time, but at the same time, I'm doing the same things as last time. So, like, what happens if I apologize? Oh, it does do an up one! Okay! So that upped one so that now it's two, and before it was just one, so now that it's two, something might change. Cause, okay. Yeah. Something might be different. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, God. Okay. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. I don't know. It's really difficult for me to figure out how to get another ending. I really hope that this works. I'm trying so hard. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, I want to support this research. Without saying anything more, I turn away and walk back along the narrow path. Oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god. I hope I made the right choice. Outside the factory, the sun is already setting. Some workers are leaving the factory as others are going in, ready to work the night shift, although no excitement shows on their faces. And now I realize I have a problem. I don't know how to get back to the city. I should have had the taxi carriage wait for me here. I could try asking one of the workers to show me the way, but I don't feel like talking to anyone right now. I walk in the opposite direction from most of this from most of the workers. Their homes are probably even farther away from the city. I don't know where I'm going, but I keep walking. It's already sundown, but even during the day this area must be dark because the street is narrow and the buildings are blocking the sunlight. My steps are heavy. The combination of lack of sleep, frustration, and disappointment has drained me. Elise. I came to the factory today to give Elise the score because I thought it would make her happy, because I thought I'd be able to see her smile, yet I did no such thing. Somehow I managed to upset her yet again. Why would she care? Having the score doesn't mean anything to her because she doesn't have a piano to play the piece. She obviously wouldn't want to play the piano at my place given what happened last time. What a fool. She still hasn't forgiven me. Even if she says she did, those are just words. In her heart, she doesn't feel forgiveness. And after hearing me say that the piano would never make a sound, she must hate me even more. How could this happen? Not only was I not able to make Elise smile, I managed to upset her again. How pathetic. No wonder Elise hates me. She should hate me. I guess I'll never see her again. I should stop bothering her. I should stop making her feel uncomfortable. I should disappear from her life. That would be the best gift I could give her. That is the closest thing to happiness that I could offer her. If I'm being honest with myself, that's the only way I could manage to make Elise happy. And I want Elise to be happy. What was it that made me think I could do anything for Elise anyway? <laughs> what a silly thought. All the money in the world, the best education money can buy, and it takes me this long to see something so obvious. Elise is doing just fine without me. She doesn't need anything from a man whose only skill is smashing crystal balls to orchestral accompaniment. She doesn't need me. Of course she doesn't need me. Dude, are you alright? I stop when I notice a man staring at my face. His clothes look as if a pig had been wearing it while rolling in mud. He reeks of dog shit. He's taller than me, but he looks half starved. You're walking like a zombie, man. Are you ill? Oh man. He's gonna just make the situation worse. Get away from me, you filthy beggar. Hey, no need to be hostile. I was just worried about you, man. Whatever, fuck off. Are you picking a fight? Do you think you can get away with that kind of attitude just because you're a bourgeois? No, I can get away with it because I'm me. Not so fast, young man. I think I need to teach you some respect. The other proles around us were watching in anxiety. Some of them walked quickly away. What are you going to do? Hit me or something? Go ahead. Try. Hey, don't push me, kid. I'll do it. Do it. I'm telling you to. Go ahead. You're cold, buddy. The man pulls his fist back and swings it at my head. However, before it gets close, I unleash the mana that I have silently amassed in my hands. In his unbalanced position, the man is quickly pulled down by an amplified gravity force, hitting the dirt hard. Ugh, ouch. The man grunts while laying on his stomach. Even after the gravity is back to normal, he's still down on the ground. What was he thinking trying to fight without magic? I step over his body and continue walking. All the other proles move away from me. Some of them go inside their houses. But there are two familiar men who keep standing without moving an inch, even as I draw near them. 
Oh yeah, these guys, the Libertans. See you again. This time you're really looking for trouble. Get lost, I'm not in the mood. Neither am I. The Libertan then speaks to his friend. Hey, let's do something about this arrogant little prick. Yeah, let's. The other Libertan backs away. The first one brings his hand forward. Something big and round is materializing in front of his open palm. A boulder bigger than his then his upper body appears in the air and then he controls the air around the boulder to fly it fast towards me. But this kind of attack is nothing for an experienced sorcerer like me. I raise my left arm. Summon! And a thick wall shoots up from the ground, shielding me from my opponent's incoming ball of rock. The two masses of rock collide with each other. The impact shatters, scatters shards of rock across the street. Before they fall on the ground, my right hand is already straightened out towards my opponent, scor scorching the burning with courage. Oh, scorching and burning with courage. God. Summon. From my hand, a fire bursts forth, its flickering flames connecting my hand and the Libertan's body. Ah! The fire completely consumes the man, obscuring his features. But even though he's burning, I can feel faith building up from him. A gust of wind blows across his body. It rakes the fire off his body like a tattered garment. Ugh, <sighs> damn it. Still panting, the Libertad member puts his left hand forward again, focusing on willpower, but this time with greater amounts of mana. Another boulder, much bigger than the last, materializes in front of his hand. With his other hand, he's readying faith. Hasn't he learned his lesson? But I'm not going for the same tactic. Instead, I dash towards the gigantic rock before him, with courage blazing within my hands. When I'm perhaps a buddy body length from him, I open my two arms as wide as the boulder. Summon. And then I widen my arms even more, stretching my hands apart as far as they'll go. Amplify! The big rock explodes right in front of the Libertan, sending him flying backwards through the air. The explosion isn't deadly, but unless his partner can cast revive, that man is down for the count. Even though I directed the explosion away from me, I took- I too took a little of the impact from the sheer force of the burst of energy. The man lands on his back nearly twenty feet from where he stood. He doesn't try to cushion his fall. He's out cold. I look at the other Libertan. Now will you stay the hell away from me, or must I do the same to you? He just stays silent while looking at me unblinking. I'm tired of dealing with this Libertad nonsense. I'm going to finish this quickly. Without giving him time to prepare himself, I summon a heap of rocks high in the air that rain down on the Libertad member. He avoids the rocks by jumping sideways to his left, but I follow his movements with my hand. A new clump of rocks appear in the air according to my hand's new position and continue to rain down fiercely on him. He keeps dodging, but he's nearing a wall, so he will have nowhere to go. All of a sudden, I feel the aura of his faith. He casts wind that blows on my rocks, sending them flying back at me. I quickly try to erect a rock wall to shield me, but his wind is too fierce. Before I can cast my spell, those speeding rocks have plowed into me like a stampede of wild horses. Ah! I fly backwards through the air, my body shaking with pain. I try to roll myself sideways in midair to lessen the impact of hitting the street, but there is no impact. Still in the air, I'm suddenly caught in a tornado that sends me hurling upward. My body keeps tumbling higher and higher. I'm being jerked around violently and can't tell which way I'm pointed. Just when I slow down before reaching peak altitude, I feel scorching heat from below. Fire whirls up through the swirling wind and engulfs me. Ah! I can feel myself starting to cook. I concentrate a barrier around my body to minimize the damage, but it won't last long in a fire this powerful. Thankfully, the fire is soon extinguished because... A gale hammers me from straight above. I plummet to the ground like a meteorite, my body leaving a smoke trail from the extinguished fire. This is cheating. This is illegal! You're not allowed to attack your opponent if he hasn't recovered from your previous attack to a ready stance. This guy doesn't know how to fight. Pretty sure I made this comment last playthrough, but there's no rules when it comes to fighting. It's just in, it's just in sports. Fights? No rules. You just fucking kill each other. All the dirty ways. All the nasty tricks. That, that, that's how you win. The last thing I remember before everything goes black is, is the streak coming up to catch me. Fast. And he's out for the count and kidnapped. Yay! Wind day, 31.6 till us a.m. 3.13. And I'm gonna save. And...
these are the stats right now. Though I'm not sure if they're good or not. Like, uh, this doesn't look good at all. I don't know if I improved anything or made anything different enough to get a different ending. This is really tough to figure out. Ugh. But it doesn't seem like it. Because if I remember correctly, everything's just going to end the same way that I had it end before. Because we're not making any progress with the piano. So... Something's not going to go right because of that. Uh, I don't know. Well, it'll get figured out. Hopefully I get a different ending. Hopefully. So, yeah. I guess I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. Hey guys, and this is my end card. So I decided to change it up a little bit because this series, or uh, parts of the game, I guess. I don't really know what to call them anymore, because there's some games that are episodic, some games that aren't, some games that are in a series, some games that aren't. Anyway, this has been going on for a while, so I thought I'd change up a few things, like the thumbnail and the end card, because, yeah, no one wants to hear me say the same thing all the time. But, if you do want to see more of my content, just click on my icon and it'll take you to my channel. If you want to see the next episode of An Octave Higher, click on the annotation for that, or just even hover the mouse over it, it'll tell you whether it's up or not. Uh, I've been playing Minecraft Story Mode, so if you want to check that out, there's an annotation for that. There's also an annotation for the Reject Demon Toko, which is completed, and the Sword of Asumi, which is another type of visual novel out there that I was kind of intrigued by for a short period of time. So yeah, if any of that interests you, go check it out. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Later.